A Virtual Guide to Stracy Arms Drainage Mill Welcome to Stracy Arms Drainage Mill and thank you for joining us on this virtual tour. During this tour we will investigate how the mill worked and we'll also reveal some of the mill's hidden history including how it was used as a fortified position during World War II. Before we go inside we should say something about the mill and the job that it was required to do. This mill has stood here midway between Aikling and Great Yarmouth in Norfolk since it was built in 1883. Its job was to lift water that had been drained off the Halvergate marshes and deposit it into the River Bure. The Halvergate marshes extend east from here to Braden Water near Great Yarmouth. The busy A47 separates the mill from most of this vast expanse of marshland, almost 10 square miles of it. The marshes provide excellent grazing for cattle during the summer months. Waterlogging of this low-lying land during the winter can significantly reduce the quality of pasture, so it's important that water levels are managed. The Halvergate marshes are also an important area for wildlife, especially birds. Increasingly, management practices that control water levels to support conservation are being encouraged. Stracy Arms Mill no longer serves a drainage function, it stopped working in the 1940s. It was replaced by an electric pump with controls housed in the small square shaped building that stands next to the mill. Anyway, the door of the mill is already open, so let's step inside. So this is the ground floor of the mill. There are two more floors above us. Since the sails are at the top, and that is where the story really starts, we're going to go up there first and gradually make our way back down again. Before we go up, I should mention that this mill was built by Richard Barnes, who owned Southdown Ironworks in Great Yarmouth. He died in 1890, and this is the only example of a complete mill built by him that we know of. As we go up the ladders, you will notice that the vertical shaft has R. Barnes Engineer Great Yarmouth 1883 cast onto it. Right, up we go. Please hold on to the handrail and no more than one person on the ladder at a time, please. So here we are on the second floor. The cap of the mill is sitting right above us here. There are two windows on this level, both with views along the River Bure, east towards Great Yarmouth and west, out towards Acle. If you look down there, you can see the roof of the building that houses the controls for the modern electric pump. There's a lot going on up here. This horizontal gear sitting at the top of the vertical shaft is called the wallower. The larger vertical gear that it meshes with is called the brake wheel. The brake wheel is fitted to an axle called the wind shaft that goes out of the cap. The four sails are fixed onto the end of the wind shaft. You'll notice that all the gears and axles are made from cast iron. Stracy Arms was a very modern mill when it was built. Older mills were made with wooden components. The wind shaft through the brake wheel is hollow. Passing all the way through it is the striking rod. This allows you to alter the shutters on the sails without having to stop them. Moving the striking rod forward and backwards causes shutters on the sails to open and close. Adjustments can be made according to the prevailing conditions. I've actually got a bit of archive footage here from 1983 when the late millwright John Lorne fitted a new set of sails. When you get back home you can watch the full video on the Norfolk Windmills Trust YouTube channel. Um, it's fairly straightforward here in as much as the mill sails swing fairly close to the ground. On a much bigger mill of course sometimes these sails clear the ground by as much as 20 or 30 feet and then it's even more precarious because you have to uh, actually climb up on the ladder, up on the sails itself. But um, if the sails are new, if you've just made them or checked over them, uh, you don't worry too much about this. How tricky a job is this one for you? Well, it's fairly straightforward, I think. Um, the main consideration was the worry of the weather, and of course it's uh, held fine, so really it's just a matter of assembling a, a large Meccano set, in effect. Everything has been fitted prior to arriving here at the mill, and uh, if it fitted in my yard, well, of course it should fit here. The fact that you're 20 or 30 feet off the ground really doesn't make too much difference.
and I've got a couple of photographs here from the 1960s, when Smithdales of Acle restored the mill. You can see several modern health and safety regulations being broken in these images. This diagram shows the whole mill, and you can see that it is really part building, part machine. It's designed solely to transfer energy from the horizontal movement of air to the vertical movement of water. When the mill is running and there is sufficient wind, the sails rotate, and they do so clockwise as you face the sails from the outside. This forces the wind shaft to turn, as well as the brake wheel that it's attached to. The teeth of the brake wheel, enmeshed with the wallower, cause it to rotate, and of course this motion turns the vertical shaft. We saw the bottom of the vertical shaft on the ground floor, and we'll go down there in a minute to see what happens next. But before we do, we have to ask the question. What happens if the wind changes direction? The sails are designed to turn when the wind blows into them head on. If the wind blows into them from behind, it is what is called being tailwinded. Several things can happen when a mill is tailwinded. These range from nothing to total destruction of the mill. So the whole structure above our heads works to ensure that the sails always face into the wind. The entire cap turns as the wind changes direction. This is how it works. The fan wheel at the back of the mill catches the wind. You can see the gears next to the fan wheel and the axle running down to the cap. It's connected to a kerb that runs around the top of the tower. As the fan wheel rotates, the cap is wound round clockwise or anticlockwise depending on the direction of the wind. When the sails face the wind, the fan wheel stops spinning, which causes the cap to stop turning. Let's go back down to the ground floor now to see what happens next. We'll pause on the first floor to get our breath back and to learn a little something about the mill during the war. It's best to go down the ladders backwards like you would do on a stepladder at home. Take care please. There are two windows on this floor looking out north and south. You can see that the north facing window has good views across the River Bure. In 1940, during World War II, there was a real risk that German troops might invade through the port at Great Yarmouth. The mill was fortified so that it could be used to fight against any attack. The river, the road and the railway, all close to the mill, could have been used to transport enemy forces. A number of embrasures were punched through the walls so that the mill became a very tall pillbox. You can see the holes in photographs that were taken around that time. These holes are bricked up again after the war. This photograph was taken during a restoration when the render was removed from the walls. You can see the bricks where the opening used to be. On the ground floor, one of these embrasures has been opened back up again so that visitors can see what it would have looked like. Let's go down there now. Careful on the ladder. So we're back on the ground floor. We've seen what causes the vertical shaft to turn. You can see that this large crown wheel will turn this bevel gear here and that the shaft runs out of the building. If we go outside now, we'll be able to see what happens next. What a beautiful day. That axle we saw inside goes into that black metal container at the foot of the mill. It is usually kept locked, but we have special permission to lift the lid and take a look inside. So this large gear is attached to the shaft from inside the mill. The smaller gear drives an impeller at the bottom of this tank. The rapid spinning of the impeller creates a vortex that forces water upwards and out. If you look there, you can see the sluice gate, which controls the water which flows out into the pond. As I said earlier, the drainage function of the mill has been taken over by an electric pump. It all works automatically. But I think it's worth thinking about those who had to run this mill before. This grainy image is the only photograph we have of George Arnup, who ran this mill from when it was built in 1883. His father ran a previous mill on this site, so both mills were once known as Arnup's Mill. Of course, the mill is known today as Stracy Arms. In George Arnup's lifetime, this was the name of the public house on the adjacent site. Both were owned by the Stracy family of Rackheath Hall. The Arnups ran the mill until the late 1930s, when the job was taken on by Fred Mutton. 
Fred and his family continued to live at the Mill House until the 1960s. Dame Kathleen Stracy donated the mill to Norfolk County Council in September 1965. It is maintained by the Norfolk Windmills Trust. It was the second mill to be taken into their care. The mill is a popular stopping off point for tourists and other visitors, particularly boaters along the River Bure. Refreshments, supplies and gifts are available from the independently run Stracy Arms Mill Shop and Tea Rooms next to the mill. Well, thank you for joining us on this tour. Please send a link to your friends if you know anyone else who might enjoy it. We can show as many people around as we like online. And of course, please subscribe to the Norfolk Windmills Trust YouTube channel.